All right, before I start my message, I want to take you, I want to I tell you a little bit about the journey I went on to get to this message. So back in January, my team and I sat down and we said, okay, let's plan our girls' night out. And so we came up with this fun idea to have kind of like a campfire type feel for this one. And I said, let's get that country band. That'll be so fun. Let's dance. Let's have a good time. And, and it all sounded really good when I was sitting in my office. <laughs> And then as it got closer and I started thinking about campfires and tents, I thought, really, Shannon? Because my idea of campfires and tents is to totally avoid them. <laughs> I'm definitely not a camping girl. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Jimmy said, well, there's this thing called glamping. I said, glamping? I thought they were joking, and then they started to show me places where you can pay a lot of money to go glamp. <laughs> Basically, glamping is sitting in a fancy tent that has a chandelier. <laughs> and honestly speaking, that didn't make it a whole lot more appealing for me. My idea of camping is in my house. So, needless to say, I said, okay, well, I'm going to talk about seeking God and being in his presence, and that's a really broad spiritual topic, and it sounded good. And as we got closer, I kept trying to get inspired on what I was gonna share with you. <laughs> and I kept starting on one thing and I just felt like it wasn't right and then I'd go to something else and then I'd get into it and then I felt like that wasn't right. And then last week, I, well actually the week before now, I went to the Hillsong Color Conference in New York and I was sitting in a session and I was taking some notes and, and one of the worship leaders was talking about entering into God's presence when you worship. And I thought to myself, you know what? That just connected with me. And, and, and I began to study that actually in New York in my hotel room. And then on the plane as my children so fabulously slept. Yes, and everyone on the plane was so relieved. Um, <laughs> I really got to study. And when I came home this past week, you know, I... Uh, I was teaching this past weekend, and on Friday afternoon, last Friday, Elena came to my house, and she was watching my kids so that I could go over my notes for the weekend. And when I finished going over my notes, I really felt like something came up in me, a direction for tonight. And so I was sitting in the back of my house. I have a little office back there, and I was looking, and I was studying, and I felt like God took me to a story in the Bible. And it's the story of Paul and Silas, and many of you know it. They're in jail, and they're sitting in a prison, and they cry out to God, and they begin to worship, and, and something miraculous happens, and they, they are freed from the prison. And the, the man who's holding them in the jail, he then comes to know God, and it's a beautiful story. And so I made some notes, and then I thought, okay, I, I had some ideas kind of running in my head. <laughs> I would love to tell you that I can do a message like my dad. You know, he sits down, it's very quick, it's very orderly, and Jared and I are in total awe of him. But it takes us a lot longer to get there. And so I felt like God was taking me on a journey. And then Saturday night when I came to the service... A little bit more had developed in my mind and I stood up and I told you ladies all weekend that if you were fighting a battle that you felt like you couldn't win, that I believed that tonight was the night that you were going to win. And to be very honest with you, I felt impressed in my heart to say that, but I wasn't exactly sure where all that was going to go. And then Monday morning I was at the school and I was working on a whole bunch of stuff for the end of the school year and then I closed my door and I sat down to work on my lesson and, 
And I began to see my lesson develop. And to be honest with you, I feel 100% in my heart that this lesson is for you. It came from God because I can honestly tell you that nothing in my own natural understanding of the word had ever looked at it this way. So I'm very excited to share it with you. I text, amen. I text my graphics people and I said, remind me, because I wrote this whole lesson and I got real excited about it. And then I said, wait a second, there's a verse already out there. There was a verse on the invite. I said, I got to tie it to that verse. So I, I called Ollie and I said, Ollie, what verse is on the, on the invite? I don't remember what we did. And she sent it to me and So I got out, thank God, and my dad taught us how to use a concordance and all that good stuff. And so I got it out and I started looking. And to be very honest with you, (laughs) I felt so overwhelmed. Because when I began to look at that verse in the concordance, I realized that God was literally speaking to me all those weeks. And this is why. Matthew 6.33 is the verse that was on that invitation. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I told you that when I was in New York, I began to think that I really wanted to talk to you about entering into God's presence through worship. And so... As I began to look up that verse in the concordance, that word seek there, but seek first the kingdom of God, that word seek means worship. I couldn't believe that because I had never looked at it in that way. And then I went on to study the rest of the verse and it says seek first the kingdom of God. Well, the kingdom of God is referring to the kingdom of heaven, to his word and his name and his promises. So we are worshiping the kingdom of heaven. We're worshiping God and his word. We're worshiping his promises. It goes on to say and his righteousness. When I looked up that word righteousness, I, I, I was just shocked, to be honest with you, because I had always read that verse and read it from the standpoint of that when I seek first God and then I do my best to live righteous, then good things will happen to me. But that word righteousness actually means justice. So when I f- seek first the kingdom of heaven and his justice, All these things will be added to me. When you look that up in the concordance, it says that then the preceding things, meaning the kingdom of God and all that that encompasses, his promises and his word and the power of his name and his justice will then manifest in your life. So you can understand why I was so overwhelmed in that moment because on Saturday I had stood up and said, I believe that God has told me that on this night that God's gonna fight a battle for you. So if you've been fighting an unfightable battle and the whole time I, I never really had gone back to think about the original verse and it was an afterthought, but then I realized that it was no afterthought at all. You see, God's hand had been in it from the beginning. He planted the thought in my mind about worship without me ever understanding that that word seek meant to worship. And then he planted the thought in my heart about his justice fighting for you without me ever understanding that that word righteousness meant justice. So then we understand that this verse and the theme of tonight is that when I enter into God's presence, when I worship the kingdom of heaven and all that it involves and I seek after his justice, then the kingdom of heaven and its promises and his justice on my behalf will then manifest in my life. The title of my message tonight is Seek Him. I hope you brought your notepad because I'd like for you to take some notes if you did. What is worship? We all have a 
probably a visual image in our mind of what worship is, but let's talk tonight a little bit about what the Bible definition of worship is. The Bible definition of worship is two things. Number one, it's defined as an attitude. You see, we are to constantly worship, meaning we're to live with an attitude of worship. We're to have an attitude of worship towards our God, towards the kingdom of heaven, towards the things in his word, towards his name. You know, I love that song that Brian was singing earlier because in such a powerful, emotional way, it reminds us of the power of the name of Jesus. You see, we're to live with an awe, a good kind of fear, a reverence, an attitude of awe and reverence at the magnificence and the power of the kingdom of heaven and all that it encompasses. The second type of worship is an act of worship. It's an actual action. There's a lot of ways that we do that. It's something that's defined or demonstrated in what we do. And ways that we do that is, you know, we, we give our money. That's an act of worship when we sow it in God's house. When we serve here at the house, that's an act of worship. When we come together in church and we lift our voices and we worship our God like we were earlier and we just enter into his presence, that's an act of worship. When we pray, that's an act of worship. And understand tonight that an act of worship can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to be here at church. You can worship in your car. You can worship at home. In fact, I would take a moment here to encourage you ladies that every day you should perform an act of worship at some time in your day, if not more than one time in your day. You see, the Bible says that when we draw nigh to God, that he will draw nigh to us. When I seek after God, when I worship God, then the manifestation of all that he is and all that he is defined by and all of his goodness for me, his justice will manifest in my life. You see, there's no reason to not perform an act of worship every day. I know a lot of times that's hard for people, especially people who are new to God, to actually visualize and understand, but let me just tell you how that works even in my own life. You know, I like to exercise. I enjoy it. I know that's hard to believe, but I love it. And when I'm on the treadmill, I put on my earphones. And sometimes I'm jamming out to some good pop top 40 music <laughs> but a lot of times I'm listening to worship music because I'm doing that at six in the morning and I'm beginning my day by worshiping God and everyone's asleep in my home but that doesn't matter it's me and God you see I'm drawing nigh to him and he's drawing nigh to me when I was in my car and I was on my way here tonight I was playing worship music and I was just singing in my car. And I'm sure everyone that was riding with me probably wished I would be quiet because I got my dad's voice, not my mom's. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> when God hears my praise and worship, he sees it as perfect, amen? And every morning after I make my breakfast and I walk back to my bathroom, I get my communion out and I have a moment where I worship God. You see, it's not something spectacular, ladies. <laughs> and I would love to make you feel and be able to say to you that it's some profound spiritual moment, but please let me share the reality of that with you. I mean, when I'm in my car and I'm worshiping God, like every five seconds, I'm like, yes, Emery, yes, uh-huh, okay, uh-huh, let me give me the iPad, let's change it, let's do this, let's do that. You know, it's okay, you gotta be real here. But God understands all of that. 
when I'm doing my communion, sometimes my communion takes 60 seconds and sometimes it takes 10 minutes, depending on the amount of interruptions. But that's okay. We get through it. And every night when I lay in bed, I close my eyes and for a second, I just say, thank you, Jesus. And I confess the promises of God's word over my life because I understand that when I verbalize them as an act of worship to God, when I seek and worship the promises of the kingdom of heaven, then I know that they can then manifest in my life because I'm giving life to them. So see, every day you should live with an attitude of worship, and then you should perform acts of worship. Now, some of you came here tonight, and you're carrying a burden, and I knew that you would come here that way because I told you this weekend that some of you were going to come here who had been fighting a battle for a very long time. If you're from our church, then you probably believe in the goodness of the nature of your God because we teach you that our God is a good, good God who cannot do evil, amen? But despite the fact that you're believing in that, maybe you sit here tonight and you've been losing a battle or you're not experiencing the victory in some area. Maybe some of you are even at a point of desperation. Well, I believe beyond a shadow of tonight, a shadow of doubt, that tonight is a significant night. It's the start of a turning point in many lives. I believe that tonight, God's justice, His righteousness, and the kingdom of heaven are going to prevail. Amen? You see, tonight we're talking about unwinnable battles. We're talking about how to fight the unwinnable battle and then win. You see, as women of God, we're living in a fight. You are called to fight. Now, some of you don't want to hear that. You want to live a fairy tale life that doesn't exist. Just because you're a child of the king does not mean that you are not in the world. There's a devil in the world who seeks to destroy your life. This life is a fight, but it's a good fight. First Timothy 6.12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Second Timothy 4.7 says, I have fought the good fight fight. Ladies, you've got to see yourself in a different way. You've got to see yourself as a warrior girl. You've got to see yourself. I mean, you know, all I can see in my mind is super girls. And maybe you would understand if you lived with Caleb and Emery because all day, every day, they are Spider-Man and Supergirl. And they are putting all the bad guys in jail. And they do it with total confidence, no matter how big the bad guy is. Because you see, they're not afraid of anything. Ladies, I believe that God is calling on you tonight to be a super girl. Amen. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Why am I sharing this with you? Because I'm going to take you through a lesson here in a minute, but I got to get you a little psyched up. You see, you got to get ready. You got to get your mindset right. This is a night that battles are going to be won, but they're not going to be won by fairy tale princesses. They're going to be won by super girls who are going to stand up and fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Can you do it? Amen. If you came here tonight and you've got a battle that you need to win, then I want to encourage you to open your heart right now to receive. Open your heart. Make up your mind right now that this night is for you. Prepare to win. Amen?
Look, I want to share with you a story tonight. It's a story about a man in the Bible named Jehoshaphat. A lot of you know the story, but if you brought your Bibles, if you'll go with me to 2 Chronicles 20, we're going to go through this story. Now, Jehoshaphat was a good king. He was a good guy. And under his reign, the people enjoyed a great time of prosperity. He was king for over 25 years, and he was marked by his faithful devotion to God. So Jehoshaphat was a godly man, and he was living after God. He had a heart towards God. In fact, he took a stand for God because at the time, a lot of the kingdoms around him were worshiping idols, and Jehoshaphat said, no, my kingdom will be devoted to God. He's known later on in the Bible, he's referred to or considered a hero of the faith because he was so devoted to God. His greatest moment is a remarkable story, and I want to share with you that tonight. So if you brought your Bibles, we're going to start in verse 1, 2 Chronicles 20. After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Munites, I think, declared war on Jehoshaphat. The messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazon. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news, and he begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Now Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. And he prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and they built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity such as war, or plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us and you will hear us and rescue us. And now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt, so they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us? How many of you have had people that you went out of your way to help and life turn against you? That's exactly what's happening here. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave to us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this army. You see, we're talking tonight about battles that you can't win. The unwinnable battle. You see, Jehoshaphat had a good army. He was a good king. In fact, they compare the level of prosperity that his kingdom um, experienced to that of Solomon's. So the people lived in a good way, and he had a good army. He was prepared for the battle. But then three armies rose up against him. So they're fighting a battle that they're powerless to stop. We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children, the spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of, son of, son of. We'll skip that. Verse 15, he said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. 
tomorrow. March out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your possessions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. For he is with you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Will you let me finish the story? Verse 18. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites began to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me. All you people of Judah and Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers, they were worshipers, to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his splendor. And this is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord, his faithful love endures forever. At the very moment that they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. The armies turned against their allies and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his man went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could even carry. There was so much that it took them three days just to collect it all. And on the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of the Blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is still called the Valley of Blessing today. Then all the men returned to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat leading them, overjoyed that the Lord had given them the victory over their enemy. They marched into Jerusalem to the music of the harps and the lyres and the trumpets, and they went straight to the temple of the Lord. When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Isn't that an awesome story? You see, Jehoshaphat's nation was under attack by not one, not two, but three armies. And he was completely in a helpless position. Jehoshaphat had his own army prepared, and, but he had not, and he had not been irresponsible, but he had no idea that an attack at that magnitude would come against his life. You see, a lot of times I think we as Christians were prepared for the average attack and we can fight that battle but sometimes we fight a battle that is so big that no matter how prepared we are it's beyond anything that we could do you see how could a nation of one fight three nations if you're taking notes tonight I'm going to walk you through some very valuable lessons that I think we can learn from this story of Jehoshaphat lesson number one you must always be prepared for battle. You've got to be ready for battle, ladies. You see, a lot of times we run to God and we run to the house of God and we run to leaders in the house of God when the battle comes at our life. I think there's a valuable lesson to be learned here and that is Jehoshaphat was prepared. You see, he was already a man after God. 
He believed in who God was. He believed in the power of God. We understand that the word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing. Well, the biggest thing that faces a struggle is our faith when we are pressed in a super heavy way. So if our faith is not already built, if our strength is not already secure, if we're not already prepared and filled with God's word and worshiping God and seeking God and we don't have an understanding of how the word works, then it's gonna be difficult to rise up in the battle. You see, when Jehoshaphat got word that the three armies were coming against him, he didn't have a phone where he could go Google what to do. When Paul and Silas sat in the jail, they didn't have anyone to call. But what they did have was their knowledge of who God was. What they did have was their knowledge that they served a God who had promised them good things. What they did have was an understanding of the word and they were already living according to the principles of his word. You see, if Jehoshaphat hadn't been running his kingdom according to the principles of the word, when the attack came, he would have been in more trouble if his army wasn't already prepared. You see, when he cried out to God, God said, go to battle and his army was ready. You've got to be ready for the battle. There's this amazing verse in Jeremiah 9, verse 23. It says, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he knows me and understands me. You've got to have your life in order. You've got to be prepared for battle. And the way that you do that is that you have a true knowledge and understanding of who your God is. You have a true knowledge and understanding of what his word says. Amen. So not knowing what to do. Jehoshaphat, who had a heart towards God, who was living his life according to how God said he should, who was running the things in his life in line with the word. He was living orderly, not knowing what to do. He did the only thing he knew to do. He hosted a day of prayer for the entire nation. Look, when you don't know what to do, When you don't know what to do, you turn to God. Lesson number two. When you don't know what to do, turn to God, not to man. Not to man. When the devil attacks your life, when you're fighting a battle, you've got to be really careful who you listen to. It's amazing how when things start to go wrong in our lives, everybody wants to jump in and offer their input. Right? Like the world is full of people who are naysayers. It's like they want to... They like talking about negative, negative things. They like talking about defeat. But when you don't know what to do, you've got to turn to God, not to man. You've got to shut the voices out of the people who can't speak what God would speak. You've got to be wise about what comes out of your mouth. You've got to be careful who you listen to. You see, when you're fighting a battle, if you're not wise, you can turn on Christian television and you can find people who will tell you that God is letting you fight the battle, that he wants you to suffer, that he wants you to learn a lesson. And all that does is cause you to drop your weapons and quit fighting and sit back and think, okay, God, let me see what I can learn from this. But let 
me remind you that the Bible says, let no man say that God tempts, tests, or tries anyone. Let men only say that God is a good God and a God of love who brings victory to all of his children. So you have to be careful who you listen to because when you're in a battle, you cannot afford to stop fighting. You cannot afford to drop your weapons. When you're in a battle, be careful and be reminded that you must run to God and not to men. Don't allow confusion and fear to fester and grow in your hearts because you're listening to the wrong people. Amen. Look, some of you are here tonight and you feel like the odds are stacked against you. In fact, you feel totally outnumbered and you don't know what to do. If that is you, then you have got to turn to God. You've got to declare a day of prayer. You've got to turn to God and not to men. You've, in fact, you need to shut the men out unless they're people who will stand in faith with you. Amen? Now back to the story. So the Lord answers Jehoshaphat and he tells him, hey, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of this enemy for you. Now I want you to put yourself in Jehoshaphat's shoes for a moment. So you're sitting there and you've fallen down on your face and you said, oh God, oh God, I don't know what to do. I've got like a thousand men and there's like 15,000 out there. And God says, don't worry about it. Just get up tomorrow and march on out there and you're not gonna have to fight. I'm just gonna take care of it. <laughs> and yeah, yay, we're clapping. But put yourself in his shoes. Would you have not stopped for a moment and said, hey, wait a second, was that actually God? Because would God tell me to do something that stupid? Maybe what God meant was that I was supposed to run and go the other direction. In fact, maybe one of those other kingdoms will hide us. Maybe they'll help us out. Which leads me to lesson number three. The third thing we can learn from Jehoshaphat is that when you're fighting an unwinnable battle, you must choose to respond to God with trust. You must choose to trust him. It's not always the easy choice. In fact, it's not usually the logical choice. Our mind will tell us not to believe that the impossible is possible. But the word tells us that with God all things are possible and that the impossible is possible. So when God says I will rise up and fight the battle for you, then I must make up my mind to trust him. The Bible definition of trust is confidence. It's confidence. It means I've got to rise up and have a confidence in what he is saying. I've got to have a confidence in God and not a confidence in people or circumstances or my emotions. See, when you're fighting a battle, you're not just dealing with the issue. It's not just the thing in front of you. It's everything going on on the inside of you too. You see, your mind will run wild and your emotions can get crazy. And the circumstances can start compounding and get worse and worse. But you've got to make a decision like Jehoshaphat did. Even though there was a few of him and a whole lot of the enemy, he said, that's okay. The Lord has spoken and I choose to trust what the Lord has said. Despite the fact that the natural circumstances tell me this battle is not winnable. I choose to believe. Trusting God requires us to shut our minds up and to have confidence in the word. You know, it's one thing to believe the word when you're not fighting a fight. It's one thing to believe that the Bible says that Jesus will heal you when you're not sick. 
It's another thing to believe that Jesus said that he bore your sicknesses and your diseases when you're facing a diagnosis. You see, because when the natural circumstances have attacked your body, you have to choose to not believe those circumstances. You've got to choose to have a confidence in words on a paper that say that Jesus bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases, and by his stripes, you are healed. But you heard the story of Jehoshaphat, and you understand what can happen when you choose to have confidence in your God. So Jehoshaphat chooses to trust in God's response, and then he and the people do something that's magnificent. Magnificent. You see, they haven't seen God give them the victory yet. But before they go to battle, they worship. They worship. They fall on their knees and they say, your love endures forever. They begin to worship God. Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who will trust in the Lord will find new strength. When you worship God, when your response to God saying, I will deliver you is, I choose to trust in you, then a new level of strength will rise up inside of you. A new level of courage will will rise up inside of you. A new level of confidence will come alive in your heart. Amen. He and all of the people worshiped. Now he lived with an attitude of worship and then he began to perform the act of worship and he led others to do the same. There's another valuable thing to look at here in Jehoshaphat's life. You see, when the devil comes against your life, ladies, the battle, the way you fight the devil is not just about you and how you fight. You see, all the people around you that you influence are going to be affected by your response to the attack. See, the Bible says that my children are the heritage of the Lord, that they are sanctified by my faith. So when the devil comes against my life, I've got to lead my children in a way to know that they can fall on their knees in prayer, they can lift their hands in worship, and they can have a total confidence that what the word says is yes and amen. See, your response is not just about you. It's about everyone around you. So who are you leading? How you fight this fight is important. How you rise up in the unwinnable battle is important. You can't lay down and give up. You've got to rise up and keep fighting. So the next morning, Jehoshaphat and his men, they get up and they go out. And right before they're about to march, Jehoshaphat stops and reminds the men of what the Lord said and that they must trust him. When you get up to fight, when you get ready for battle, the devil's going to try to scare you again. When you go back to the doctor's office and he's discussing the results of the test with you, the devil's going to try to scare you again. You've got to remind yourself of what the word says. You've got to re-encourage yourself. You've got to re-establish your confidence. And then you've got to march on. Amen? Amen? Lesson number four. You've got to shut fear out. When you gear up to fight, the devil will attack you with fear like never before. Why am I telling you this? Because I understand that tonight when you leave here, you're going to be all pumped up. You're going to be ready for the battle. You're going to feel like you've won and you will have won if you remain confident, if you shut the fear out, if you tell the devil, I do not have a spirit of fear. I choose to have a mind that is stayed on him. I choose to have a mind that is confident and trusts in the word of God. Amen. You've got to tell fear that it's a liar. It's a liar. 
It has no place in your life. The report of the Lord is truth. Amen. Amen. So Jehoshaphat, they march out, and he sends the singers ahead of the army, and they're worshiping, and they're praising God. And I just want you to think about that for a second. I mean, they're marching against an army that's more than three times the size of theirs. And what are they doing? They've got their hands up in the air, and they're declaring that even though we're small, even though we don't look mighty, we are strong in the Lord, and we are able, because we're not going to fight this fight, God. God is fighting it for us. Amen. I was thinking about them and I was thinking to myself, you know, I wonder what they felt when they marched out there and they were looking at the sea of men and they had heard the reports. And then I just imagined that they were probably so embedded in the presence of God that they had shut all of that out. Their mind had stopped focusing on that. And instead their mind was focusing on God. You see, they couldn't afford to focus on what was in front of them. They could only afford to focus on who was in them. They could only afford to focus on the promises that they had heard, amen? Lesson number five. Always worship him in the midst of your battle. Always worship him in the midst of your battle. Now we know that that's not our natural first reaction. It's not always easy to worship when we're struggling or we're fighting, but understand tonight that it is the right thing to do. No matter how you feel or if you're wondering where God is, always know that his word says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Throw your hands up in the air and draw nigh unto the God you serve. Amen. <laughs> Worship him in the middle of your battle. So Jehoshaphat meets up with the enemy. And the unthinkable has happened. The enemy has all destroyed itself. They've all turned against each other. You see, ladies, when you face an unwinnable battle and you choose to seek, you choose to worship, you choose to trust in God, you choose to seek and call out and trust in his justice, God will fight for you and you will not lose. You see, victory does not always come down to the natural factors or the preparations of the things of this world. It comes down to who is fighting with you. Amen. God will fight your battles for you. His love will win those battles for you. Remember, his love already conquered death, hell, and the grave. What could be worse than that? So now Jehoshaphat has the victory. And there's such a valuable lesson to be learned there. Remember, a lot of us run to God when we need him. But Jehoshaphat has won the battle. The victory is his. In fact, he's now in a much better place than ever before because there was so much gold and so much good stuff and he's gathering all this stuff and now the land where he defeated these three armies is called the Valley of the Blessing. Because God has brought wealth into his life and into his kingdom. So he's in a really good place. And what does he do? Lesson number six. When you win the battle, run back to the place of worship. 
Run back to the place of worship and give honor to whom honor is due. When Jehoshaphat wins the battle, the men throw their hands up in the air and they give honor to whom honor is due. They march back to Jerusalem and they head right back to the house of God and the whole kingdom worships and gives honor to whom honor is due. You see, it's not just about seeking God when you need need him. It's about seeking God all the time. Amen. Don't take your eyes off of him just because the battle is over. Continue to honor and worship him. Continue to live with an attitude of worship. Continue to constantly perform acts of worship. There's so many valuable lessons to be learned from Jehoshaphat. I mean, always have your life in order. Always keep your priorities straight. Always, no matter how bad it gets, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Don't seek the input of the wrong people. Don't start running out and talking about your problems and letting doubt and unbelief start growing in your heart. Start running to the people who will remind you that the report of the devil is not truth. The report of the Lord is truth, amen? Keep your heart and your mind focused on him. You see, Jehoshaphat understood that the impossible was possible when he was in God's presence and God's presence was with him. He understood that if he would worship, that if he would seek after God, instead of relying on all the things he had or the natural preparations of his own life, that God's justice would show up in a supernatural way. I told you one story tonight and time and time and again in the Bible, we see God intervene in supernatural ways. He steps into impossible situations. He steps into unwinnable battles and he, they win. Moses understood this. I mean, God parted the sea for him. Paul and Silas lived the strength and power of being in God's presence when they sat in a prison with their arms chained together and their feet bound together. And as they begin to cry out to God and sing the Psalms of David to God, an earthquake invaded the prison and they became free. They understood the power of God's presence. We can enter into that presence, ladies, at any time if we will cry out to God through prayer and through worship. And when we do that, we can do like God told Jehoshaphat. We can be still and know that God is God. Yeah. Ladies, tonight, I believe with all of my heart that you can experience the power of victory right here starting tonight, that God can and will bring you to a place where your unwinnable battle can become a victory. And I believe that that can happen for you when you choose to enter into his presence and then you choose to trust in the victory that he promises you. When you study God's presence in the Bible, you will find verse after verse that tells you what it means. It says when we enter into his presence that there is joy, there is pleasure. It says that there is rest and refreshing. When we enter into his presence, it says we are found. When we enter into his presence, there is mercy and grace. There is patience. There is healing. There is encouragement and strength in his presence. There is justice and victory in God's presence. Ladies, tonight we're going to go to battle. Are you ready? We're going to enter into his presence. We're going to cry out to God, and then we're going to let him fight the battle for us. Amen? We're going to fight the fights that look like they can't be won. Whatever you came here tonight, 
I want you to begin to think about that. Whatever it was that you're facing, whatever issue is going on in your life, and I want you to start listening to what I'm saying to you. You see, tonight you're going to quit being a victim. Tonight you're going to stop living and desperately hoping and just going from one day to the next, barely getting by, and you're going to rise up and you're going to stand in a place of strength and honor. You're going to step into the valley of the blessing and you're going to declare that your God is able, that the victory is yours, that his promises are yes and amen. Tonight we're going to enter. Hebrews 10, 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Ladies, tonight, as we go to battle, I want you to prepare to enter into his presence and to do it with boldness. You see, if you're here and you're a child of the king, then tonight you can present your prayer and your praise to God with boldness. You see, because of the blood of Jesus, you can enter into his presence with all boldness. Look, we're gonna do two things. As the leader here tonight, I'm calling a time of prayer. I'm calling a night of prayer for you, ladies. God told me that tonight was a night that we were going to fight the unwinnable battle and we were going to win because he is going to fight for us. Look, we're going to get down on our knees. We're going to trust in God. We're going to fight with him on our side. But I want to build your faith for a moment because I know sometimes it's hard to believe that something that big could be over just like that. You see, this Jehoshaphat miracle was not a one-time story in the Bible. In fact, it's a God specialty. Isaiah 45, 2 says, I will go before you, and I will make the crooked path straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze, and I will cut the bars of iron. Deuteronomy 9, 3 says, Therefore, understand today, that the Lord your God is he who goes before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and he will bring them down before you. Exodus 14, 14 says the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Second Chronicles 32, 7 says, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Isaiah 49 verse 25 says, for I will contend with him who contends with you. Proverbs 20, 22 says, wait for the Lord and he will save you. Jeremiah 1, 8 says, do not be afraid of their faces for I am with you to deliver you. Isaiah 59, 19 says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Deuteronomy 3, 21 says, you must not fear them, for the Lord your God himself fights for you. And just as God told Jehoshaphat, Second Chronicles 20 says, you will not need to fight this battle. Just position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord God you serve. Ladies, do you believe tonight that your unwinnable battle is coming to an end? That God is your salvation and he is here to deliver you in Jesus' name, do you believe that God will fight for you? If you believe that, then get up on your feet. Do you believe that with him, the impossible is possible and the unwinnable is winnable? Amen. First, we're going to pray. 
I believe that when God showed me the story of Jehoshaphat, that we were to copy that pattern, so that's exactly what we're gonna do tonight. If you came here tonight and you're fighting an unwittable battle, I want you just to cry out to God. If you need to get down on your knees, then get down on your knees. God knows the details of that situation. But first we're going to pray. We're going to cry out to God. And I'm telling you right now that God has declared that he's going to take care of it. So make up your mind that as you pray, you're going to pray with boldness and confidence in his word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, tonight, I lift up the women who came in here, the women that are facing an impossible situation, that are fighting a fight that they just can't seem to win. Father, tonight, I believe that just as you showed up for Jehoshaphat, that you are here in our midst because your word says that when two or more are gathered together in your name, that you are here. So tonight, Lord, we give you those situations. We choose to stand still and to trust and to know that you are God and that you're a God who's a good God, that you're the source of our salvation, that you're contending with those who contend against us, that your promises are yes and amen.